This is Eric Hayden with the National Weather Service in Binghamton, New York. Something new we're trying here this year is online training for our Skywarn program via YouTube. We've done some online classes in the past, but you had to be here a certain day and time. Now with YouTube, you can view this information anytime. I want you to sit back, relax, enjoy our class. It's just about 36 minutes long. Just as importantly, if you like it and you want to become a spotter, hang on until the end. We have ways for you to sign up, and we always encourage feedback. If this is something you like and you want to see more of, please let us know. Again, Eric Hayden with the National Weather Service in Binghamton, New York. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to our Winter Skywarn here in Binghamton, New York, our YouTube version. I want you to sit back over the next 10 to 20 minutes, learn a little bit more about the weather service, why we need spotters. We'll talk about winter hazards in our area along with products and preparedness. The last part of the class is the real meat of the class in terms of teaching you and training you how to measure snow and ice, when to report that information to us here in the National Weather Service, and how to do that. Last five minutes, we'll focus on some questions and wrap things up. First things first, why we're here. The National Weather Service, our main mission is to protect life and property. Here in Binghamton, New York, this is our coverage area, roughly central New York into northeast Pennsylvania. So some of the big cities such as Syracuse and Utica up to the north, through the Finger Lakes, down through Binghamton, and into the scranton Wilkesbury area. Roughly about two and a half million people, and we are open 24-7. We are just one of over 100 offices in the country that has that main mission to protect life and property. Now, where Skywarn comes in, this is a program that uh, is run by the Weather Service. It's a volunteer program, and the main goal is to provide ground truth reports of significant weather. Bottom line is, what is actually happening at the ground? In the summer, are you seeing high winds, hail? In the wintertime, are your roads icy? How much snow do you have? We have a lot of technology at our disposal, Doppler radar. However, it does have its limitations, and that's where we need spotters to kind of fill in those gaps. One reason we use those reports is they really assist us in our decision process. Again, you can confirm what is actually happening at the ground, or you can let us know, hey, it's not as bad as perhaps the radar shows. And that helps us gauge how, how bad the storm is, how bad the roads are, and that provides credibility to a warning. If we get reports of snow and ice covered roads and we can convey that message, that helps our mission of protecting life and property. And we say this over and over again, the trained eye of the storm spotter is still our greatest asset. You folks help fill in the gaps and confirm not only what is happening, but what is not happening outside. I mentioned some of the limitations of our technology. We do have Doppler radar and we can uh, see a lot of things and um, you know get a good idea for what's happening across our area, but it does have its limitations. Since this is a winter class, we'll focus on the limitations during the winter season. On the left is a typical radar picture during lake effect snow uh, where we don't have a lot of lake effect snow in terms of it's not a huge event. The greens and blues are indicating some light snow across central New York, but notice the absence of snow from Rochester over toward Oswego. Uh, the radar is not showing snow, but in this case they were actually reporting it. And what's happening is we are overshooting that snow because of the limitation of the radar. The graph on the right shows this. Uh, the radar itself uh, shoots out a beam of radiation at 0.5 elevation. Now because of the curvature of the earth, that lowest beam as it gets farther and farther away from the radar gets higher up. So if you have lake effect clouds or snow far away from the radar, often we only see the top part of the storm, if not overshooting it completely. If the lake effect uh, snow is closer to the radar, we can see it much better because we can see not only the bottom of the cloud, but right on through the top. Now in the summertime, a thunderstorm 30, 40, 50,000 feet it doesn't matter as much, but lake effect clouds tend to be shallow, uh, perhaps as low as five to 10,000 feet. And uh, again, this is why we can overshoot that snow sometimes. And the radar may say it's not snowing, but when indeed it is. And that just reaffirms why we need those reports. Another visual example, this is um, an indication of the reports we get from weather stations in our area. All the blue dots on this map give us temperature and wind speed, but only Syracuse, Binghamton, and Scranton report snowfall. 
Now, as I go forward, notice all the red dots. Those are our latest spotters that we have trained over the past year, and that really helps us fill in the gap. So yeah, we have a lot of data in some of our bigger cities, but our rural locations are represented quite well, giving us that information on exactly what is happening. Switching gears a little bit, winter hazards in our area. Yeah, we get the cold and a lake effect snow, but we also get wind storms and we can get flooding. Think about January 1996 and April 2005. Uh, so it's more than just snow and ice around here in terms of winter hazards uh, that we have to deal with, really running the whole gamut uh, across our area. Before we get into that, I want to talk about preparedness. First, in vehicles, the biggest thing on this list to keep in mind is something to keep warm. While it's always a good idea to have food and water on hand, around here the road crews do an excellent job clearing the roads. So you do want to be prepared uh, for being inconvenienced for a couple hours, perhaps as simple as your car breaking down. So I like to advise folks to have an extra set of hat and gloves and a jacket and boots in your car, maybe a, a smaller snow shovel uh, to help you get out of a bad situation. Just be prepared to be on your own for at least a couple of hours if perhaps you get stuck or your car breaks down. Now at home and work, you have to think more long term, at least a couple days worth of supplies for food and medicine and water. The other thing we have to kind of keep in our mindset uh, since we're talking about the winter months is a way to stay warm. If you have a wood furnace, a fireplace, be prepared to use that. If you don't have those items, have a plan to go somewhere else to stay warm. Because again, in the winter months, if we have an ice storm and you lose power, you could also uh, as well lose that heat source. We're talking about winter storms over the next couple of slides. And I like to think about Mother Nature in terms of ingredients. If not all of the ingredients are in place, things won't happen. In the case of a winter storm, you need cold air, you have to have moisture, and you have to have lift. If you're missing one of the three, then a storm will not come together. Now when we're talking about lift, we're talking about rising air in the atmosphere, and we'll have more on that here in a couple moments. First thing first, you have to have cold air. We can't be talking snow or ice if it's 50 degrees outside. Often, we look to our neighbors up to the north in Canada for that source of cold air. Uh, usually, it's in the form of high pressure. Winds flow clockwise around an area of high pressure. So in this case, this would be a north to northeast wind dragging that cold air down to, into our area. So you've got to have the cold air if you're talking snow or ice. One ingredient you also need is moisture. You need something to form the clouds and eventually the precipitation. That's usually something we are not lacking in our area. If you've spent any amount of time in central New York and northeast Pennsylvania, it can be quite gray around here, fall into the winter. And we have a lot of large bodies of water near us, as close by as the Great Lakes, but also the Atlantic Ocean and also the Gulf of Mexico. So moisture, we are usually not lacking. The last thing you need is a source of lift, and this is why you often, if you watch um, the weather on television, hear about low pressure systems and cold fronts and warm fronts. Think of them as the triggers of the atmosphere. You can have all the cold air and moisture you want, but you need something to set everything off. And one unique thing we can get in our area is lake effect, snow or rain, and that's just caused by temperature differences. That can cause lift as uh, well as mountains, and we'll talk about that here as we head through the next couple slides. One big source of lift, area of low pressure. Often we'll call that a nor'easter in the northeast. Uh, this came about from mariners that before satellites couldn't see out hundreds of miles into the ocean for storms, they would notice as an ocean storm would approach, the winds would tend to back into the northeast, and that's where that term came about. If you're a snow lover, this is the type of storm track you want. You want an area of low pressure that kind of hugs the coast, uh, maybe from Philly up toward New York City and Boston, and that really puts us on the cold side of things. If the storm track's too far out to sea, we miss it, but with this storm track, we're close enough that the counterclockwise winds around the storm bring up lots of warm air and moisture, and that rides up and over the cold air at the surface and it produces snow inland. So a coastal track is a good track for snowfall in our area, and this is often uh, where we measure in feet of snow for some of us and get our biggest snowfalls. 
Now, on the flip side of things, in Alberta Clipper, it originates usually in Western Canada near the province of Alberta, and that's where the name came about. It moves very, very fast, and because of this, it doesn't have time to get moisture from the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. So typically in our area, a couple inches to at most five or six, that's about it. We're not talking feet of snow with a nor'easter, with a Alberta clipper, uh, because they move so fast. If you do like snow, often near and just north of the storm track will be your heaviest snows. But again, we're talking a quick burst of snow. It can be intense but usually not long in duration compared to what nor a uh, nor'easter would produce. Lake effect snow is something unique to not just our area, but the Great Lakes and other uh, areas across the world that have large bodies of water and relatively cold air. This is a nice diagram of lake effect snow. We're talking relatively warm water, uh, lake water temperatures in the 30s and 40s, not going to go uh, into the water swimming by any chance, but relatively speaking, much, much warmer than that colder air as it crosses the lake. As it does, that temperature difference, remember I mentioned lift, uh, produces some rising air and that produces clouds and eventually precipitation. Farther downstream, terrain can play a big role in terms of how much snow falls in, in, in uh, any given area. This is a nice map that our friends up at the Burlington, Vermont office, National Weather Service produced, uh, showing the average annual snowfall in the northeast. You can uh, really quickly see a couple bullseyes, one east of Lake Erie, and then closer to our area, one due east of Lake Ontario. In fact, that purple and white shading, the Tug Hill Plateau, greater than 150 inches on average of snow per year. Those are certainly snow belts, and that's where we get a lot of snow in our areas off of uh, Lake Ontario and Erie. One of the reasons uh, for the longer uh, amounts of snow or larger amounts of snow is the fetch. Uh, on a due west wind, uh, that goes over the whole length of Lake Ontario and that produces uh, the snowfall in places like Lewis and Jefferson and Oswego counties. Now on a northwest wind across the lake, the fetch isn't quite as long, but still you have another little bullseye, Tully, Truxton, Cortland, uh, the hills south of Syracuse in our area can get it pretty good with a lake effect snow. Now talking about lake effect snow on a due north wind, you can get some lake effect snow, Elmira, over toward Hornell, uh, Bath, that area, but the fetch over the lake is much less and that's why you folks don't see as much snow. Another little bullseye of snow down in northeast PA, this is certainly from uh, an enhancement of lake effect snow. You may not measure in feet uh, down through the Poconos or say Carbondale, that area, but you get a dusting to an inch or two now and then uh, versus you folks in the Wyoming Valley don't see as much. Now in northeast Pennsylvania, we don't see as much lake effect snow, so if we're going to see snow in our area, it primarily comes from nor'easters. Uh, climatology, uh, roughly 25 to 50 inches of snow in northeast Pennsylvania, but due to the lake effect, on average, 75 to 125 inches of snow, quite common across parts of New York State. Now, we mainly focused on snow so far, but as you get into the winter, sometimes you can get other types of precipitation, and it's usually because of what's happening upstairs in terms of warming up. This is a nice diagram of illustrating it. This pink uh, area is uh, indicating temperatures above freezing. If we have a, a thin layer of above freezing air, uh, that's just enough to melt the snowflake into a raindrop. It will refreeze and then fall as a sleep pellet. If the layer is deep enough, uh, it never has a chance to refreeze until it reaches the ground, and that's what we call freezing rain. That's really the most dangerous type of precipitation that we can get in the wintertime because it really creates an ice skating rink on any surfaces that it falls upon. Gropple is not in, um, on this graph, but it's something that we get quite commonly, at least once or twice in the fall and a handful of times in the spring. It's one of those days that's sunny for a few minutes, then some showers, rain and snow showers. Often we get rainbows uh, that part of the year. It's when Mother Nature is in her transition season, can't really make her mind up. You've got raindrops and snowflakes falling, and what happens is the snowflakes, as they fall, they bump into water drops, and they start to con, uh, compact into tiny snowballs. So they don't completely melt. When they hit the ground, you'll see these white little tiny snowballs, unlike sleet, which would be clear since it's rain. So grapple is something you may not have heard of before, but we get it quite often uh, in the fall and spring across our area. 
Another consequence of warmer air higher up in the atmosphere can be ice storms. Uh, sometimes we can be in the teens and 20s and you might say, how can this happen? And again, it's because you have some warm air uh, higher up in the clouds. Ice storms were concerned because the, as the snow, as the ice uh, sticks to trees and branches and power lines, you can have issues with power and communication lines coming down and you can have huge consequences. It's one thing to be without power in the summer, more of an inconvenience around here. It can be life-threatening, however, in the winter when you're talking staying warm. Now think back to the nor'easter map. I showed you a storm tracking from the big cities and along the coast. That was an ideal track for snow lovers around our area. For ice storms, it's a track that's either over us or to our west. So here's an area of low pressure uh, tracking out of northwest Pennsylvania heading right for us. Again, winds flow counterclockwise around an area of low pressure. Because of that, southwest to southerly winds are pushing warm air into our area. Meanwhile, at the surface, cold air is very, very dense, so slowly it will retreat. But in the meantime, as that warm air rides up over the cold air at the surface, you can get snow to sleet and then eventually freezing rain. Uh, so if you hear about a storm track near or to our west of our area, at the very least we'll probably uh, deal with the transition to some type of ice and then hopefully uh, quickly over to plain rain so we don't have any major ice storms in our area. In addition to snow and ice, we focus mainly on winter type of precipitation, but we can get flooding. Uh, January thaws, think of January 1996. Our most recent issue with snow melt uh, flooding would be in spring of 2005. This is a nice graphic illustrating how much water is in the snow. We call this snow water equivalent. Bottom line is if you were to melt all the snow down, what would be the equivalent amount of water? In this case, it was two to six inches. And that would be the same thing as, as, as if you had a thunderstorm that produced that amount of rain. As we go forward into the first couple of days of April, the graph on the left showing that only the highest of the elevations across our area, the Poconos, the hills between Syracuse and Binghamton, the Adirondacks, the Tug Hill, still have some snow on the ground. For all intents and purposes, the snow is gone. And then on the right, notice the um, image, some of those yellows and magentas and especially reds, radar estimates of three to five inches of rain. So you're, you're melting off two to six inches of water, putting that into the rivers and creeks, and now you're adding rain on top of that. And you can have devastating flooding, over uh, approaching $100 million worth of damage. I know we had worse flooding for a lot of us in 06 and 2011, but this is uh, from uh, snow melt uh, runoff. That's something we haven't seen here for about 10 years in terms of a major consequence for our area. Another type of flooding you can get is ice dam flooding, and this is usually more localized. The last couple of winters have been very, very cold. It's common around here to have at least some ice cover on rivers and creeks and streams. With ice jam flooding, if you get rain or uh, water going into the river system, it can raise the level of the river and that breaks up the ice. Now this can happen from snow melt. It can happen for, uh, from rainfall. Bottom line is the river level will rise as the water goes into the system. And as it rises, the ice breaks up and it flows down the river. A very, very natural process. However, some bends in the river, maybe the pillars from a bridge, uh, they can jam up the ice. And once a jam, uh, you know, the ice gets jammed up, you can have water rising behind it that can cause flooding. And then eventually that dam will break and then you can have a flash flood downstream. So ice dam flooding is very hard to predict. We know when the conditions that would cause it, but it's usually quite localized and more dependent on the topography of the river itself. Now we kind of laid the groundwork. We talked a little bit about winter hazards in our area, some preparedness. Getting back to our core mission of protecting life and property uh, here at the Weather Service, we do it in a tiered approach uh, from outlook to watch and eventually warning and outlook phase. On this graph, we'll start on the far left. Uh, the time until an event is way in the distance, and that means our certainty is quite low. And in that case, we issue an outlook. An example would be, three, four, five days from now, we expect a, a big storm, but it's way too far to be uh, overly confident. So we may issue an outlook. Hey, a heads up, have a storm headed our way. This is the time frame. This is what we're looking at. Continue to check back for updates. Now on that graph, as we get closer to the event, 
our certainty increases eventually toward a watch and then when we get very close to the event uh, we're confident enough either for a warning or an advisory so to go over some of the products and outlook like I mentioned the confidence is low it's just a heads up hey this is a time period we're looking at continue to check back for updates as we get a little bit closer one to perhaps as many as three days in advance we may issue a watch keep in mind when we issue a watch just means we're medium confidence about 50 percent uh, that that will occur examples include winter storm watches as we continue to get closer we have to make a decision roughly from about 12 hours to about a day and a half in advance we like to issue either a warning or advisory if we issue it a day and a half in advance you know we're really confident if it's not until about 12 hours before it happens we're not as confident in terms of hey it's probably a complicated situation the only difference between a warning and an advisory is the impact the confidence is the same 80 percent confident for a warning and advisory the difference is the impact warning is life-threatening and advisory is nuisance so around here it would be a couple of inches of the snow that would be a, an advisory 8 10 12 15 inches of snow a lot of ice blowing snow that would be a warning uh, so a warning is worse than an, uh, an advisor in terms of impact uh, but is just equally as confident some ways you can get our information highly recommend our mobile site mobile.weather.gov feel free to check it out on your PC but this works very well on your mobile devices smartphone um, you know things of that nature um, that would really uh, be a benefit you can enter your city and zip and get uh, information that way other ways you can find out information, social media. If you uh, haven't followed us yet, you can do so on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Pretty easy to find us. Just search NWS Binghamton. Uh, so it would be twitter.com slash NWS Binghamton. And you can do the same thing on YouTube and Facebook. And as always, know Weather Radio, our latest forecasts and warnings automatically go there. Very important, especially in the middle of the night, if we're talking especially severe weather as we get into the summer. All right, the first part of the class, lay down the groundwork, who we are, National Weather Service, main mission is to protect life and property. Uh, we can get many different types of hazards in our area. If you're a snow lover, if you like a storm track up the coast, ice storms usually attract near or to the west of our area, and we can have really just about any type of winter weather um, across central New York and northeast Pennsylvania. This is a part I really want you to pay attention to because this is how you can help us. We're going to talk about newly fallen snow, how to measure snow, where you should do it, how to make that report, and then we're going to talk big picture down the road, other types of observations such as ice, flooding, and also summer severe weather. Now, measuring snow is typically more difficult than something like rain with rain you can have an automated gauge read it from inside or even if you have to go outside you're just looking at it once with snowfall we like you to take multiple measurements for an average and that makes it a little bit more challenging you got to get dressed throw your boots on trudge through snow but it's very important information not just for us here at the weather service but many many other sectors not only in the government but also the public sector use that information first thing you have to do is right now as you're watching this video think about a good location in your yard I'm going to give you the ideal you get as close to that as you can you want something relatively open so you don't want to be by your house tall trees but you also don't want to be in the middle of a field where it drifts not all sites are going to be perfect so again try to get as close to this as possible we certainly understand limitations this is a good spot in the field but you're surrounded by trees that are a good enough distance that you're not uh, having any issues with blowing and drifting snow when I think about my house I'm just trying to get away from the house itself and big trees I've got a lot of trees in the yard but I find the most open spot that I can and that works pretty well it is important to stay away from those trees because it can limit the impact of how much snow falls. In this example, this is snow measured under a tree, and I appreciate the folks at Coco Raws uh, for some of these slides as we're going to show you here over the next couple minutes. In this example, this gentleman has measured three inches of snow under the tree, and now in a typical suburban setting, he's just moved to the central part of his yard and now measured six and a half. So you can see there's still trees and bushes around, 
but you just want to get away from them, certainly not underneath them where it will limit the snowfall. Pretty easy. What can you uh, use to measure? Ruler, measuring tape would work just fine. I'm a snow lover. I love lake effect snow, so uh, I always have my yard stick out hoping we get a lot. You want to measure to the nearest tenth of an inch. I know some rulers don't have uh, tenths of an inch, just round up or down. So if it's uh, five and a quarter inches of snow, uh, 5.25, just round up to 5.3. You want to take an average, uh, measure in a few spots where there's no drifting. And you just want to get a general, general idea of how much snow has fallen. You don't want to be like me as an eight-year-old kid growing up between Baltimore and Washington. I would measure on the left part of this graphic. I always wanted to have the most amount of snow and uh, I would measure in drifts. <laughs> you want to measure uh, a couple of times. You don't need a calculator or do long division. Again, you're just trying to get an average representation of how much snow has fallen. Now, what can you measure on? A lot of folks measure in their yard. That's okay. Uh, some folks measure on a deck. Um, I do that as a first estimate, but again, decks are usually connected to your house. You want to kind of get away from that. Um, you definitely want to avoid measuring next to a uh, driveway or road, especially in the fall or spring. Uh, those surfaces can heat up quicker and have a lower amount of snow near them. A snowboard would be the best way to do it. Uh, they're not too hard to make, roughly two by two or three by three. It's a plywood piece of wood, uh, painted white so it doesn't absorb heat or sunlight. Uh, and that will give you more of an absolute zero. And what I mean by that is you can measure in the grass, but there's two problems with that. One, it's going to be slightly higher because uh, you're going down into the blades of grass. In addition, we're in upstate New York and Pennsylvania. We get a lot of snow. How are you going to clear the spot for the next event? Versus a snowboard, it's an absolute zero. You know when you hit that hard surface, that's the zero mark. In addition, you can clean it off and uh, much easier for the next snowfall event. Uh, so definitely recommend to make a snowboard if you can. Now, how often should you measure? At the very least, we just want to know how much snow fell from the storm. So at the end, as close to the end of the snow as possible, measure it. We do encourage more reports throughout the event. Um, perhaps our forecast is going wrong. Perhaps we just want to see, is our forecast right? Give us a call halfway through. Just be really clear. Um, that you're giving us a running total. We have shift workers here at the Weather Service. You may speak to a few different people. Um, so just give us a running total. Don't assume that we know that you called a couple other times. An example would be, hey, it's noon. I've got 6.7 inches of snow here in Scranton. It's still snowing. I'll call you folks later this evening when it's all over with. Once you're done, you want to clear your location. Again, it's real easy with a snowboard. You've got snow on it. You just lift it up, dump it back into the spot. Uh, where you were measuring and I like to mound some snow up under the board and kind of raise it up like a plateau especially if it's windy out because what will happen is the snow tries to drift it will actually go uh, to the low spot around the board versus on the board itself kind of a little trick with that here's a typical event or just to uh, emphasize measuring as close to the end as possible the snow starts at 9 in the morning at 1 o'clock you measure 2.4 inches of snow sun comes out there's some melting and settling and by the next morning uh, there's 1.2 inches of snow this is just emphasizing as much as you can you get home from school or work or what have you you want to measure here as close as possible so if it stopped at one two three four five o'clock is much better than the next morning and that will become more of an issue especially in the spring and the fall kind of, kind of the ends of the season uh, we can get a lot of settling so in summary, nice level spot, uh, and again, you want to pick that location now. Now's the time to do it. You don't want to wait for the snowstorm itself. Slide the snow sticker ruler into the ground until it reaches the board. I forgot to mention this on the last slide. If you do use a snowboard, learn from me. It took a couple years to finally take my own advice. Mark the board because a white, white board in the snow is definitely hard to find once the snow starts flying. We're concerned with the newly fallen snow to the nearest tenth of an inch, and once you're done, be sure to clear your location and you're ready for the next snow. So how can I make my report? We're going to stress many different ways that you can make your report. Pick the way that you're most comfortable. Uh, we, you, you can call us, you can email us, you can get on Facebook, but again, 
Just pick one way that you uh, feel comfortable reporting and you'll notice a theme over and over again. No matter how you report, you should do it the same way. First things first, say who you are. You're a trained Skyborn spotter. Give yourself some credit for sitting through this class, taking the training. Where do you live? What your observation is to the nearest tenth of an inch and the time of observation. The email is a great way to report. Everybody can do it that way, so again, uh, make sure you say that you're a spotter so that we know that. And since you're emailing us, snap a picture and send it to us. Nothing better than that to keep people off the roads if it's a dangerous situation than showing them a picture of how bad it is. When should you report? Roughly when you get two inches of snow or greater. Reason why we pick that as we get into a real winter, January, February, a dusting, an inch or two of snow, not really a big deal for us. We don't need to know about that. The one exception in amount is snowfall rate. If you get an inch of snow in a half an hour, that's a big deal. You get an inch of snow in a half an hour on Friday evening during rush hour, that's a huge deal. So we're talking snow squalls. If you got a snow squall, give us a call. We're not as concerned that you didn't have a ton of snow. We're more concerned that you had you know, quarter mile visibility and you couldn't see for 30 minutes. That's a big deal. We need to know about that. And again, the extra mile, um, call us at the end of the event, but if you can call us through the event, that will help us. And we say no, roughly you know, every three hours, uh, no more than that uh, is necessary. Other things you can report, any amount of ice. Um, not as concerned with the amount like we are with snow. Um, by all means, you know, be safe. You could put up a ruler against a tree branch and give us a accretion how much it uh, fell. Uh, we're more concerned with that it's actually happening. And what, what is it occurring on? Just sidewalks, streets, trees, you know, uh, those types of things. If you live near a river or a creek, we do have a river ice program that's very successful. Our, our hydrologist, Jim Brewster, would like uh, you to contact him. And he set up an online way that you can report this information to us. It really helps us out a lot with ice jams. They're hard to uh, predict when they will happen, but we know the ripe conditions and that can help us with that. So if you're interested in that, send Jim an email at james.brewster at noaa.gov uh, for that information. Another way you can report in addition to the email is online reporting. This is our website, weather.gov slash BGM. A lot of icons at the bottom, but I want you to click on the green one in the middle row called submit a storm report. When you do that, you'll see many different ways you can report. We're going to cover Facebook and Twitter. There is an 800 number. You're welcome to do it that way. Uh, you won't get a chance to talk to us. It's automated. Uh, here's the email. Uh, but I want to encourage you to use the storm report at the top. If I click on that, there's a pull down menu where you can select the time and date and location. Again, all things we want to know. And then scrolling down to the bottom of the screen, you can uh, click off the event type. Is it a flood, hail, snow. Highly encourage you to uh, provide additional details. Perhaps you live on a mountaintop. Uh, maybe you measured this two hours ago. You know, any extra information that we don't know is good. Put in your information. It's voluntary, but especially a phone number. If we need any clarification, we'll give you a call. And down here in the observer profile, change this from general public to train spotter. Again, you've sat through the class. Your reports has a little bit more credence the fact that you've gone through this training. And then uh, you can review the report and you can submit it. Now, looking farther down the road, other things to report. We like to think of our training in the spotter program here in Binghamton as 24 seven, but also 365 days of the year. Our bread and butter is winter weather. You're going to have snow to report. But don't forget about us in the summer. You see a tornado, any size hail, flooding, you know, something uh, significant, closed roads, uh, high streams, heavy rainfall amounts. Use, um, you know, those reports, please let us know. There is more information on those types of classes. I'll cover that at the end, but kind of keep that in the back of your mind that we want to hear from you uh, throughout the year. Another way to report, social media, Twitter and Facebook. Again, make sure you say who you are in terms of a trained spotter and include video and pictures of what's happening across our area. We do encourage you to contact the office directly if it's something urgent, tornado, hail, you know, large hail, something uh, life-threatening where we need to know right away. But social media is still a good way to uh, 
communicate information to us, maybe that's less time sensitive, like a snowfall report. If you haven't checked out Coco Raw's, an awesome program, we help with it. Uh, it's not run by the Weather Service, but we certainly help. It's CocoRaws.org. If you go to that website, uh, there's uh, self-paced training. If you just click on training slideshows, and I encourage younger folks that want to get into the field of meteorology, retirees, or weather enthusiasts to do this. What Coco Raws is is it's reporting every day. You buy a rain gauge, it's $25, $30. It's a standard rain gauge, not automated, very accurate. And you measure rain and snow every day. Now, most of the time, 70, 80% of the time, you're reporting zero. You'll log in between seven and nine each morning and report that information. We get it here at the Weather Service. It helps with climatology, but also day to day, how much has happened. And again, this is for somebody that's really into it. Perhaps you're already recording weather. It's a great way to record it. And then since it's online, you can look back at what has happened at your location. We love for you to call. We love your snowfall reports, but there are times we do not need your report. When not to report anything less than two inches. We don't need to hear about a dusting of snow, you know, February 28th. By then, We've been through it. Uh, so again, anything insignificant we don't need to know about. Uh, calling the office for forecasts, those types of things. Again, uh, you're a train spotter. Uh, we're expecting you just to report um, information to us of what's happening. To summarize the reporting procedures, online is a good way. On our website, you can email us, social media. I mentioned Coco Raws, and if you're any amateur radio operators out there, uh, especially during significant events, a major winter storm, major ice storm, we will bring up the net for that information. I mentioned future classes. This has a winter feel and this will carry us through the winter time, but don't forget about us year round. In the spring, we have the sister class to this. It's called Basic Spring. It focuses on summertime and spring hazards, high winds, hail, tornadoes. The advanced class is called Advanced Skywarn. We go into radar interrogation, talk about dual pole radar, supercells, uh, really get into it. Another class is Flood Skywarn. We talk about flash flood hazards and river flooding and encourage you uh, to make rainfall reports to us. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, we always post this information on our website, weather.gov slash BGM. Uh, we also do it on Facebook and Twitter. Our goal is that you report year round. We're very realistic. The best chance you're going to get to report to us is during the winter when we have snow. In the summer, it's probably going to be rare that you have a true hail or high wind report. Uh, so that's why we do many of these classes to encourage you to report to, uh, to us really as much as possible. All right, you're all done the training. What's next? One more step, and that's to sign up to be an actual spotter within our program. To do that, we have to head on over to our website. Let's take a look. One of the easiest ways to get to our website is to go to our national page, weather.gov, and then what you want to do is click on Central New York or Northeast Pennsylvania. That will send you to the local page. You can always do a shortcut here, just do weather.gov forward slash BGM. Now, most of the time throughout the year, we will have some sort of link up at the top for upcoming training, whether it be fall or spring training. Sometimes though, we are not having classes, and that's why I want to point you to something at the bottom of our website. In the lower left, click on the Skywarn icon. When you go to that section, you will always see any upcoming classes that are occurring in our area, both online and in person. If you continue to scroll down the page, there's a lot of useful links, but the one I want to point out is our Skywarn registration form. You've just done the training on YouTube. You want to click on that and say continue. It's a basic Google form with some of your information, where you live, email address, and phone number for our spotter program. Keep in mind, we want your best email and phone number so that we can get a hold of you if there's active weather, and that's how we let you know about upcoming classes classes in our area. We hope you found this training worthwhile. Again, my name is Eric Hayden. I'm a meteorologist with the Weather Service in Binghamton, New York. Feel free to get a hold of us if you have any questions, and we look forward to seeing you in our spotter program.